So now we're going to hear from Mark Humayan, uh, who's Professor of Ophthalmology, Biomedical Engineering, and Cell and Neurobiology here at USC, and also the Cornelius Pings Professor of uh, Biomedical Sciences. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Mrs. Hayes for coming here. Uh, after all, we're doing this to try to help patients like you. And in my talk, I'll try to lay out how we can take the wonderful biology and neurobiology that you've seen and see how we can get it into, into patients. So in this talk, I'll talk about a little bit about the target population of patients that we would address. Also, some of the other approaches, how would we guide this through the FDA path and what would we do if we needed immunosuppression or, or some of the other needs? So uh, I think the key point here is that we're trying to rescue the native photoreceptors. So uh, we're putting this retinal pigment epithelium there so those photoreceptors that are there don't die uh, because that is a difficult challenge as you've already heard from David. Um, but it, as in any trial, you need clinical endpoints. So if we were to get this into the patient, well, how would we study this? And so the good news is in that in ophthalmology, we have abilities to image down to the microns level. So let me give you some examples here. This first picture is a picture of the late macular degeneration type change. And you could see here this large area a whitish area, and this is exactly the area where there's the loss of retinal pigment epithelium. So we can look at, and if you use OCT, optical coherence tomography, you can actually look at individual RPE cells. So there, when you're sitting at the camera, non-invasively, we can image at this level. Well, what about photoreceptors? We can do similarly, look at photoreceptor layers with OCT, this optical coherence tomography, or even adaptive optics, you can see here, each one of these hexagonal shapes is a, is a photoreceptor. Beyond that, we can put little tiny electrodes um, the size of a couple of human hairs right around your lids and actually measure the activity and also put tiny patterns of lights into the macula to do microperimetry, see where you can see, see where you can't see. So now you're sitting in the office non-invasively without doing anything, uh, radiation, et cetera, we can actually look down at the cellular level and see how you're doing. And this is very important in terms of endpoint parameters, in addition to, of course, our wonderful tool which measures vision. So in addition to measuring visual acuity, we have these excellent endpoint uh, parameters. Now, as David has pointed out, what we're trying, what we're doing here is, again, putting this, uh, this, these stem cells derived retinal pigment epithelium in an area right next to where there are photoreceptors to rescue them so they're not lost and uh, somebody's not left uh, legally blind. And we've talked about why it's so difficult to replace neural retina. Let me give you an example. This is when I was at Johns Hopkins. We took fetal neural retina, and this is really one of the very unique cases we transplanted this. Uh, in, in a patient, you can see down below here, and we published this in 2000, that the, the fetal neural retina actually survived and was multilayered. Here's the host retina, but it never connected. So to form a synapse between the, the donor and the host tissue is a real difficult topic and a real difficult area, and you can see here, and that's why we want to preserve your photoreceptors and your neural circuitry with these RPE cells. So, okay. And, we can get them from uh, embryonic stem cells, but is there another way to get these RPE cells? And, and you can. In fact, this is a surgical procedure that I, that I used to perform. You could cut the retina 360 degrees and just move it. You could move the fovea, the part that you read with, away from the area of the blood vessels, or in this case, the bad RPE. Well, this works in about 30% of the patients. They get two and a half, three lines of vision. But because you've cut the entire retina, uh, frequently, 20, 30 percent of the time, the retina doesn't take, so it completely detaches. So now you left, you're left with um, poor vision, then you start it. So obviously, this is not a solution that we want to pursue because of the risks outweigh the benefits. Well, what about taking cells from elsewhere in the eye, whether from the iris or even from the periphery of your retina? Just take it and just move it to the central area. Well, here's an example of that, and again, 
very limited tissue, you can get only very limited tissue. And again, because you're cutting the eye in other places, the surgical complications are too great. So, and the surgical procedure is very long. So here, so because of these complications, um, I believe that the approach we're using the embryonic stem cells will allow us to do this in a much more minimally invasive form. And just for completeness, I've also put here that there are no FDA-approved pharmacological therapies. So those of you out there thinking that, well, could we rescue these retinal pigment epitheliums by taking a pill or some injection? Well, we can't do that currently. So let's, let's look at what this surgical procedure would be like. I apologize for those who don't like to see surgery, but I think it gives you a good example of what happens here. This is um, in a preclinical setting. We're able to remove the gel in the eye. All these instruments are the size of a human hair. We use a little tiny cannula to separate the retina. You'll see that little white blep. So we're able to separate the retina by injecting a little bit of fluid. And then what we do is we put the cells on a polymer substrate, and we enlarge this little area, and then we're able to slide it in, and that's the end of the procedure. So it's an outpatient procedure, about 45 minutes, we're able to get this in, and it's uh, considerably shorter and a lot safer than a lot of those other techniques that I talked about. And here it is, uh, Dr. Rajat Agarwal, who, who works with me, is implanting this uh, underneath the retina. So uh, how would we go about doing these sorts of things? Uh, we understand that clearly we have to use FDA-approved lines and we have to work in, 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 in areas that have good manufacturing and good laboratory practices. A lot of people, uh, so we've been already in discussions with Geron and also as Dr. Para pointed out with the CHEF-1 line from uh, the Sheffield line. Uh, we also have uh, began collaborations with the City of Hope on how on to take these cells and put it on the polymers, and we're looking at both biodegradable and um, non-degradable polymers. In terms of the, the testing, this testing, uh, preclinical testing has to be done in places with good laboratory practices, and we have to just show we have a lot of relationships with these. And, BTC, for example, is down in Irvine. We've used them extensively. So we can get these uh, great uh, constructs, be able to do these animal studies in a controlled environment that then we can submit this data to the FDA uh, to try to, uh, to begin uh, doing the patient trials. Now, the three animal models, uh, there's the genetic Royal Col College of Surgeon model with the mutation that affects the RPE, there's a, uh, there's, a tox there's a toxin model where you can inject intravenous sodium iodate, it does it, and there's a surgical model. I can go in there and just rip out the RPE, and so we have all three models there. Here's an example of how do we test these animals, and this is a quantitative optokinetic test that, again, one of our colleagues, Bijou Thomas, has developed, uh, just published in neuroscience, but you can see that with these bars, wherever, whichever way they rotate, the, uh, the rat is able to follow this so we can vary the widths of these bars. So the thinner the bars, obviously the task gets more difficult. We can change the brightness of these bars. That makes it more, the dimmer makes it more difficult. Of course, we can record exactly how much time they spend uh, tracking these bars. So uh, this is, so in addition to the behavioral and electrophysiological and imaging tests we could do in patients and in these animals, we can also do histology, and here's the eye with the little implant and this, and this inherited uh, Royal College um, of Surgeons rat, and here's the human-derived uh, endothelial cells on a biodegradable substrate that David Hinton was able to differentiate. And you could see the number of nuclei, these are the nuclei of the photoreceptors that have been preserved uh, versus if you don't put the human uh, endothelial cell derived RPE in this model, which uh, has a genetic defect of the RPE. Here's work from our collaborators similarly showing that a substrate with these derived RPEs preserve the outer nuclear layer photoreceptors much greater than if you were just to put the substrate alone, meaning without the cells. So this is an example of how we can use histology. Well, what about local immunosuppression? What if we start doing this and there's a rejection? Can we get around without having to give the patient systemic steroids intravenously? Well, the good news is that in the eye, we have a, a number of local 
immunosuppressions. We can hang a little tiny, tiny pellet in the eye. This is FDA approved, which can release steroids for greater than 30 months. So this is an FDA approved product. Here is an Allergan product, which is smaller, uh, releases drug for shorter periods. So it depends on whether we want it for 30 months or eight weeks. We can use these devices to help us and not have to subject our patients to systemic immunosuppression uh, at the first step. So, um, so our, our plans are to obviously to take this, these cells and substrates and um, start doing the safety in the animal trials, followed by the efficacy testing using the behavioral type of testing we talked about, as followed by histology, and then uh, start these good laboratory practice animal trials, which is the data that we would be submitting to the FDA, and following up with the application to the FDA to start this trial at uh, the Keck School of Medicine. So um, the only thing to add is that in addition to um, you know, the number of products and companies we work with, the point here is that you have to be well versed with working with the FDA. And uh, in our particular case, we've had two IDE and PMA applications, which are uh, you, what you need. These are very lengthy, very cumbersome applications to get devices and drugs through uh, the FDA, but we have experience in that. And lastly, I'd like to conclude by acknowledging our team at, in the white at the Keck School of Medicine, as well as at Santa Barbara in the blue and at Caltech, we are fortunate to have Bob Grubbs, who's the Nobel laureate in 2005 in chemistry, to help us making these substrates, the things that you could put these cells on, and also Scott Frazier, who's a, who's a wonderful and, uh, a person in terms of advanced imaging. And in terms of advisors, we have, we're working with Scott Wickup, who's, uh, who's got more than 30 years of ocular immunology experience. Again, at Allergan, now he's at Allergan, used to be at the National Eye Institute. So he can help us both through the immunology and the access to that Posidex implant that I talked about. We've also just had discussions with Jane Lebkowski at Geron and Larry Couture at um, City of Hope, as I mentioned. So thank you for your attention.